Yep. Uh, you guys should have seen my bio and stuff, but doing been doing this for quite a while. Uh, very heavily involved in the open source community and uh, big enterprises and stuff. But uh, yeah, the talk tonight is going to be, I posted the slides up to as a comment for the meetup for tonight. And as promised, there's tons of code, lots of theory, lots of like everything, uh, lots of different languages. Uh, so it is not meant for, you know, there's going to be lots of words up on the screen and code and the rest. Uh, not meant for you necessarily to catch everything, depending on like how long you've been doing this uh, and the rest, especially for uh, those of you that have not been you know, uh, doing this for very long. There's obviously going to be a lot of concepts and the rest that are going to likely escape you. For many of us that have been doing it for a long time, there's going to be a lot of things that will likely escape you on first time around. That's why it's very detailed slides meant for you to go back to uh, refresh. In fact, I'll just uh, kind of show you I'm uh, very much cheating here in that as it says here on the slides presentation source at, um, that's because this is reveals uh, JS slide deck and uh, there's a source directory uh, in there is the ASCII doc that makes up the slide deck, uh, which is handy to like see everything that you're going to see, but as like one really, really, really long page um, as opposed to slides. But the other thing that's really useful in here is the fact that uh, virtually all of the code that I'll be showing is code in the uh, in the repository. So you know, don't uh, there's going to be lots of things that you'll probably want to like play with. So there's the code. You know, actual live work with it code. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So, I uh, the agenda for tonight is we're going to lay a little bit of groundwork for all the you know push pull async concurrent. Make sure that everybody's talking the same language. Uh, we're going to talk about some of our major asynchronous patterns. I uh, and then we're going to spend I. Uh, about half the time on Kotlin's native implementations of some of these patterns, uh, including some of the more newer stuff like reactive programming and Go routines and you know some of those kinds of fun uh, stuff. So first, some background. If we take this little bit of pseudocode of series of items, and we just want to print each one of those items. There's multiple ways that we as an industry have come up with doing that, different approaches. And they basically work out to, are you, doing, are you pulling that, those items into being printed or are you pushing them into being printed? So with the pull model, which is, you know, like your four while loops, iterators, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, basically it's going series, do you have another item? and I'll wait for your response. You do, I'll print what you yield to me. And then, you know, go back to uh, step one. So this is your while for, you know, has next kinds of operations. And you don't, okay, I'll stop asking. Very, very, you know, this is your most basic while slash for loop. <laughs> it's that last, you know, that bit that I kind of paused on, on the I'll wait. That's a bit of a problem when you're talking about uh, things where you don't know how long it's going to take until you find out whether or not there's something new for the, uh, to print. <coughs> uh, so let's try a uh, different approach. What if we push instead? So now we're dealing with events. So series, call me anytime that you have something new for me. So push that information to me. Then I can go off and do some other work. Uh, you've emitted something. I'll print it. When finished, go off and do some more work. And you're telling me that you're done. I'll do whatever cleanup and the rest that I need to do. So again, things like event buffers, messaging, all that kind of stuff is this model. And this is the asynchronous model. A lot more machinery is needed for doing it. 
a uh, lot more complicated, uh, but now the timing of things is no longer an issue. You don't need to know, uh, you don't, for like the for loop, while loop, all those kinds of things were great when it's essentially zero time for the do you have something? For this, we get, uh, get to take that off the table. And with that, let's just define some of our terms. So asynchronous, we're going to perform our operation, not wait for the result. And concurrent is usually one of the major reasons why you do asynchronous is dealing with multiple tasks at the same time. Um, we'll talk about the difference between concurrent and parallel <coughs> later, but you know, in common usage, people tend to use concurrent and parallel the same way, but they are definitely different, and we'll talk about the differences because they'll become very important later. So asynchronous is one of the things that gives us the ability to do concurrency. So uh, how do we uh, get the concurrency? We, we're dealing with a shared resource. Uh, so whether you're doing your time slicing or whatever. And so we need to figure out how do we do those handoffs on that shared resource. The two most basic ways of doing that are either doing task switching. Even uh, you usually think of that in terms of a CPU. But again, that could be on, in terms of any other shared resource like disk, like you know, database like screen, whatever, versus preemptive multitasking. So with the cooperative task switching, <clears throat> this is by far the most efficient. It's essentially where you yield control periodically from your process for another process to get a chance to, uh, to run. It's the sharing model, you know, the kind of thing that you learn in kindergarten. You know, share your toys, share your shared resource. <clears throat> Preemptive multitasking, on the other hand, is a central process that ensures fairness. Okay? So with that, cooperative uh, task switching is extremely efficient and predictable. Because just like, you know, people sharing things, you know, being nice and orderly and the rest, that's the best way to do things in general. Uh, however, if there's a little brat there, that's going to you know, take over everything, that's bad. And so uh, things don't get shared, shared uh, well. Preemptive multitasking makes sure that everyone, you know, it forces the sharing. Everybody gets that equal slice of time to whatever that shared resource is. Uh, this is much more likely to cause shared resource contention. So in the task switching model, uh, cooperative, you have your opportunity to like shut down any like access that you're doing on your shared resource so you can put yourself into a nice state for handing things off. This is basically yanking the resource out from underneath you, handing it to somebody else. So this is why you need things like mutexes and uh, re-entrant locks and those kinds of wonderful fun things that everybody that's done par uh, parallel processing uh, and you know the rest, that's just what you deal with. You know? And it's also one of those things that really destroys performance, but it allows you to have preemptive multitasking. Uh, adds a lot of complexity and affects performance, but it ensures that a bad actor isn't going to screw things up. <clears throat> Speaking of uh, shared resources, a major shared resource is the screen. One thing that people often don't realize, unless you've done a lot of UI programming, is one of your primary shared resources is the screen. All UIs forever have always been a single threaded shared resource. And it doesn't matter, here's Windows 3 for, you know, for any of you young folks, this is what we used to play with, you know. But along with that is Windows 3 was a uh, cooperative task switching uh, uh, operating system because it was still running on things like 286s that didn't allow for the preemptive, um, or they did, but you had to do fun, uh, funky things to do that. 
And if uh, for those of you that were around for these days and worked with this, remember uh, when you had a program that didn't return uh, the uh, control back to the event thread? And you could like repaint the entire window with that dialog box. That was fun stuff. <laughs> um, however, again, even there, yeah, part of the reason why that would happen is because if it didn't return control, that UI thread is happening on a single thread, there's no opportunity for anything else to repaint itself. So that's why you would get, you know, repainting the screen with whatever's putting itself in the forefront. And it, you know, your nice fancy, you know, Android systems or Mac OSs or Windows 10s or whatever it is, all single threaded. The only, you know, significant OS that hasn't been was BOS, remember that? Anybody, you know, yeah, mid 90s. Um, but yeah, get, you know, where did that end up going? <laughs> um, so, and, and one of the reasons why everything works that way is because you don't want to have locks on like particular parts of the screen. That would destroy performance, really complicate things. So that's why they have all always said this is going to happen on a single thread. And it's all event based. <coughs> what about servers? Servers have to be multi-threaded, right? Except I'm sure you've heard of this little guy. Um, this famously uh, kind of changed people's thinking on how servers were supposed to uh, serve up things. And down here, down in this uh, bottom section, this is in contrast to today's more common concurrency model where OS threads are employed. Thread-based networking is relatively inefficient and very difficult to use. Furthermore, users of Node are free from worries of deadlocking the process since there are no locks. Almost no function in Node directly performs I.O., so the process never blocks. Because nothing blocks, scalable systems are very reasonable to develop in Node. Node is famously very, very fast. Now there's some caveats to that. You have to program in it in a very different way than you would have been used to with like a J2EE system or anything like that. So let's keep some of those things in mind. So by restricting our very highly performant uh, sensitive parts of the system, like networking, like redrawing the screen, a lot of those kinds of things allows us to make a lot of simplifying assumptions and be very, very efficient. But it, it makes sure that we have to think about the problem in a particular way. <coughs> uh, so <coughs> the way that those event queues work for the screen, for the IO threads, etc. Uh, the event thread in a node process is pick up the next event on the queue, identify the event, figure out where to send it, send it to the appropriate place, repeat. So that thread, that event queue, isn't really doing much. It's just kind of picking things up and dispatching them to the appropriate place. And that's why it works for everything to go onto that queue. So with some of that background in place, let's start talking about some of our significant uh, asynchronous patterns. <coughs> Here's the code from that screenshot that I showed just a moment ago for uh, Node.js. So uh, we create a server, you know, HTTP create server. This is a function, for those of you that don't read JavaScript, this is a function, a lambda in JavaScript, um, for that takes a request and response, and this is essentially our listener that's going to be listening for requests uh, on the HTTP. Here's uh, taking a server that was created there, saying listen, and it's going to start it up. And here's going, hey, my server is starting. The thing to note on this is, of course, this executes in this order. But what's the order in which like those console logs ha come out? Starting. Yeah, you see server starting, and then you see this, and then you hit the port, and then you see this. So actual execution in some ways is kind of going backwards, though it ran this way. 
So, you know, yeah. Well, you know, if you're used to callbacks, yeah, that's perfectly normal, right? But, yeah, we'll talk about that. So, the event queue, uh, again, this is just, you know, pretty little owls. Everything's better with owls. So, talk about what we just talked about with owls. <coughs> All asynchronous code. Everything we're going to be talking about tonight is based on callbacks. Uh, so, need to make sure that we understand what that is, but they are way too primitive for us to work with on a regular basis for our complex business systems and the rest. <coughs> uh, one of the recent ways that you really see that is this fun little thing that everybody that's ever done this kind of programming is very familiar with, callback hell. Uh, so, everybody knows exactly what this is doing, right? This is clear as can be. You know, we've got our database verify user where we pass in our username and password, but then we pass in another function. And we call the callback if there's an error on it, but otherwise we call the database to get our roles where we pass in the username for it. Uh, then we try to get our database log access. And then, finally down here, we call our callback that we passed in up here for actually doing, you know, the stuff that we kind of came in here for. So it's way nested, way easy, even for this really trivial example, to get lost in where things are going. Much less if you're actually doing, like, non-trivial stuff, it's really easy to get lost. So let's pull up a uh, fun little term from functional programming, category theory specifically. <laughs> um, and I'm going to use some funky words. Uh, they're just terms. Uh, kind of like polymorphism is a really scary, evil word if you're not used to object-oriented programming. You know, that kind of stuff. They're just terms that you learn. Uh, functors <coughs> is a map between categories. What does that mean? A simple example is Java's optional, which is really a monoid, but um, so we take something and we're basically kind of wrapping it up in a function. Um, and that allows us to have this thing where we don't know what it is, but it is a thing underneath. What happens with that? is that it allows you to perform a transformation on things. In fact, if you're familiar with optional, you know you could do like a map on it and the rest to where you can perform transformations on it based on whether or not it actually exists. But you don't have to know whether or not it actually exists to perform the transformation on it. <coughs> um, one big thing about that is that you don't care how or when the value is populated. Not so much for optional. Optional is a is a very low-level kind of thing. But a major example of that is promises. In the JavaScript world, promises made a big splash on popularizing this whole concept of functors and monads in a major programming language to give you that asynchronous capability where you know that you're going to be getting something, but you don't know how. That's what promises give you. So here we've got a promise to eventually have a value. It's this promise. Uh, then when we have a value, we do something with it. And if there's an error, it gets pa passed off to this catch. But each one of these generates its own promise. And it allows us to, you know, we can still do stuff over here and uh, you know, just kind of keep going. Very similar to like that callback scenario that we saw before. Whoop. Ah. <coughs> so speaking of code, here's lots and lots of code. But if you would like to see if, you know, especially if you can read JavaScript, this is essentially what a promise does. I wrote a promise. It doesn't actually do like a handoff to, uh, to the event thread or anything. But from a workflow perspective, this is what a promise is and does. So, you know, you have your, um, uh, the, uh, 
resolved value, uh, rejected value, you know, your resolve function, your rejected function for the uh, constructor to the promise. Everybody that's written promises knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you've got your then on it, where you pass in your, uh, your callback and it behaves differently depending on what's going on. You've got your catch, and here we've got like a resolved static and a rejected static for, cre for actually creating, you know, it's, they're the identity functions to use the FP terms um, for the promise. <coughs> so, again, you could take one of those callbacks workflows and actually convert it into promises. To make it a little bit nicer, we'll see exactly what that looks like in a moment, but just to kind of prove, you know, here's creating that server and essentially converting that into a promise. It's a very mechanical operation. Same thing for like the create uh, server listener promise. It's a very mechanical operation to turn those callbacks into promises, into those functors. <coughs> And so with that, we can go create server promise. Then when we have a server instance, we actually kind of start things up. Then when we have that port and host name and things have started up, that goes. So it allows us to, in a much more controlled fashion, kind of from top to bottom, move things along. A couple of uh, things to point out here. One, this returns a promise. We'll see why that's important in a moment. Uh, and each one of these thens is an opportunity for that asynchronous yielding to occur. So it can do that handoff to pass things off so that you know, things can continue to happen. Because remember, Node is a single threaded process. So if you're not yielding control on a regular basis, not much is going to happen. <clears throat> Java's equivalent to a promise is a completable future. Uh, however, it's not pure. It, allow, it has a blocking get method, which Java programmers are used to calling. You, you call the get on the completable future. That's bad. Uh, why, exercise for the reader, is it OK but bad? to use get on a completable future, and why does uh, JavaScript very explicitly not provide you anything like that? One thing to remember is, again, Node is single-threaded, but part of the reason why Node is single-threaded is because the browser is single-threaded. So if you have a blocking operation in your code and you're doing something on a, on a single thread, everything is single-threaded, what happens when you reach that blocking operation? Everything just stops. <laughs> the whole thing just stops. Because <laughs> it never has an op opportunity to fulfill that promise. So back to promises. Uh, they make it uh, cleaner than straight callbacks, but yeah. So let's use some uh, syntax sugar. Relatively re recent thing in JavaScript, ECMAScript. Async await. <coughs> so we've got uh, the same thing, but so we say async function, and then we've got our server await this, await this. Which one would you rather program in, this or the prior? This is a lot easier to read. A lot easier to reason about. You can use your regular try catch with this. And functionally, they're identical. Uh, the transpiler will convert this into this. There's a little, you know, a few other things that it's doing kind of behind the scenes stuff, but functionally, that's exactly what it's what's happening. Uh, and it's using that await keyword as kind of a hint on like where to put those thens. Okay? Well, that's going to be important for us when we start talking about coroutines. <coughs> so 
So while the code feels like you're blocking waiting for the server, that's certainly how the code reads, like our regular synchronous code. That's not what's actually happening. It's turning into asynchronous promises, which is actually asynchronous callbacks behind the scenes. Which means that we can have this kind of high performance uh, concurrency going on on a single thread. Very, very efficient. Uh, and what that async uh, keyword does on the function is it forces the function. For one thing, it tells the transpiler, hey, look, watch out for those awaits and you know, do stuff. But it also forces that function to return a promise. This function is not you know, a blocking call. This function, when you call that function, what you get back is a promise. If you don't, you know, do, if you don't treat it as a promise, if you don't do a then on it or an await on it, it'll just kind of like start the promise, but it just, you know, like starts the promise. It's not happening synchronously though, because it's creating a promise. <clears throat> and so all of that's great if we're dealing with a single thing, exactly one thing. What if we don't know how many things we're going to be returning back from it? <clears throat> That's where you start to move from functors to monads. Again, just fancy terms for some of these things. I'm not going to spend much time here except to note that <clears throat> essentially what this means is that you have a flatten operation on things so that you're able to change the size of what it is that you're dealing with. And what that then gives you, you know, it's almost always used in conjunction with a map. So you, uh, when you see flat map, that's what's going on. You're doing a map operation, and then you're flattening the result in very much the same way that we're talking about here. <coughs> um, what that means, though, is it gives you a standard set of operations, a very uh, simple way of describing basically anything that you care to do over a sequence of items. And so if you're used to, whether it be JavaScript or Java Streams or you know, whatever your language of choice is for your collections operations, you know, your filters, your maps or collect or transform or whatever your language decides to call it, um, all the rest, all of it at the end of the day can be defined in terms of flat map. And since we uh, don't know or care because it's a functor, uh, that means that we're able to do uh, some of this more advanced stuff that we're talking about in a very mathematically provable way uh, at some point in the future, coming from infinite sequences, et cetera. And we'll take a look at all of that uh, later. So bringing things to Java, uh, here's doing like a stream of you know, two, three, four, uh, seven, nine. Uh, finding the even items, multiplying that by three, uh, just uh, taking the first item that we find, this returns back an optional, so if there's an optional present, then we print something out, and we print out first filtered, and mapped number is six. Uh, you can use parallel on this, however, this is still synchronous, uh, because it's pole-based. Uh, in fact, that's one of the big things right there is this is what uh, in reactive programming people refer to as a cold stream. Essentially what that means is that you're pull, literally pulling things in as opposed to like this, if this were an array list for, an exa for example, it's this thing in memory that currently exists and then you just kind of like iterate over it like an array. However, a stream is not, does not work that way. This is, lit, is saying, give me your next item, pull it in, and it pulls it through all of this. Give me your next item, pull it in, it pulls it in through all of this. So basically, as soon as it gets to this, um, to this three, um, oh, sorry, no, as soon as it gets to this two, it never processes the rest of these because it's fulfilled its contract by the time it's gotten here. So it's only pulled through the two. You can have a million items over here. It will only have pulled through the two. This is what's known in streams as a terminal operation. 
That's what kind of ends the stream and uh, you know actually kind of hydrates it into uh, something actionable. So let's go to the queue. <clears throat> Everybody knows queues. You know, in memory, FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, data structures like DEX. Uh, dropping files into file systems or rows into a table. And you know, a lot of you old timers are very, very familiar with. You know, that's how you do <laughs> integrations. Um, distributed queues, MQ series, Kafka. You know, it's the way that you know, especially enterprise integrations work, is by the, these kinds of things. <coughs> Let's up the ante a bit with a special way of working with queues, uh, known as actors. I. Uh, this originally came out of Erlang. If you've never heard of Erlang, it was developed by the telcos for you know systems that cannot go down. You know when you think about your dial tone, cannot go down, uh, and that's what Erlang was designed for. Um, and it's reached its modern popularity in terms of what people think of uh, for actors with uh, the rise of Akka, um, from TypeSafe, now known as Lightbend. You know, through Scala, all that kind of stuff, but it's now over on the regular Java, very popular system. <clears throat> but what it is an actor, uh, an actor is just this process, this thing that's going on that can only be communicated via a mailbox. They call it a mailbox. Um, it's basically a queue. Uh, and it shares no state. So what that means is that you know, there's no concurrent, there's no uh, parallelism, there's no need for locks. There's no need for any of that kind of stuff. Because if you're not sharing anything, there's no need to lock what's being shared. Because there's nothing being shared. <coughs> so you can run it in its own threads or processes, distribute it out. Uh, in fact, like if you're running full scale Akka, you know, you can run it in terms of like a Kubernetes cluster out on lots of different nodes and you know all that kind of stuff and it's figuring out hey is this actor still running I need five of these actors and it's doing all that work to do that but the programming model is you're sending things to a mailbox to a queue it's picking them up it has uh, no shared state in processing them and the only way they can really communicate with the outside world is also by passing messages <coughs> So impossible for there to be deadlocks, race conditions, makes it so that you can scale out as much as you have resources for scaling out. Um, so the formal properties of an actor are you designate what to do with the next message. We'll talk about each of these in turn. Send messages to other actors and create more actors. So. When, you, when it talks about what to do with the next message, that means that you can have private state. And this is you know, really useful you know, for, again, things like counters, reducers, all those kinds of things. So you're doing something with it. You're remembering what happened. You're figuring out what to do with the next thing. Hmm? Yeah, you, you have a really simple state machine inside that process. Most of what we do with computers is we have state machines. So, sending messages to other actors. Again, everything has to happen by way of messaging. Uh, I kind of caveat on here is things like files, databases, etc., are considered private state as long as you're the only thing that can modify that thing. So again, you can often use actors for doing things like writing out to a log file or writing out to a database or any of those kinds of things that's still considered private state if you're the only because remember you don't want to have anything that you need to maintain a lock on if nothing else is ever going to be touching it it's not a shared resource yeah so um, we used to have in the listener containers an mqq which has you can specify the number of listeners you want mm -hmm. to constantly review what's the difference between like the listener the pattern, essentially, including like if you're familiar with the gang of four patterns, you know how like a lot of those patterns are kind of just different nuances on each other. Same thing is there's certain things around the way that the actor works 
and therefore different um, both constraints and abilities that they're able to put those um, you know kind of those frameworks around it. So you know, like those uh, listeners on an MQ uh, Q uh, topic, whatever. Those don't have the same constraints on them as you know, like an actor does, where you know it can call other things. It's not only communicating with the outside world by messages, for example. Right. You know, uh, some of those kinds of things where by putting those constraints on it, you're able to put some other frameworks and guarantees around it. But it's also more constrained. So you know, they, they're different kind of flavors on some of the same patterns. A lot of this stuff is, you know, there's a lot of overlap between these patterns. <clears throat> and of course, you can create more actors. So if you just, you know, need uh, more resources, make more actors. If you have, you know, like some, a workload that's not appropriate for this actor and it hasn't been created yet to create that actor, it could be ephemeral, you know, to do the work that you need. So. More owls taking the same, you know, basic idea. You're sending things off to actors, splitting, you know, splitting <coughs> things up. They all, they each have their own private state. Sending these things off to this guy that has its own private state, so you can uh, fan out, fan in, do whatever it is that you need to do. <coughs> and finally, reactive programming for this async pattern stuff. <coughs> uh, it essentially Speaking of, you know, like common patterns, <laughs> for our purposes, there's, you know, for, much more formal definitions. But for our purposes, it essentially takes the observable pattern, um, pushes uh, that into working on a stream of events, and uses uh, some of these functional programming concepts to give you, again, this nice programming model for handling things in a very performant and um, scalable way. <clears throat> uh, not going to show any code at this point, partly because, you know, by the time you do, like, observables and publishers and, you know, like Java 9 added flow and you've got the reactor project and RxJS, RxJava, you know, there's lots of different libraries that all have their kind of different flavors of this, but they're all doing basically the same thing. And where its real sweet spot is, <laughs> is processing those streams of events, uh, and particularly when you don't know the speed at which things are going to happen. So if you need to do uh, sampling, if you need to do buffering, if you need to deal with back pressure, any of those kinds of things where, you know, this is like cranking out events, this is the consumer of it, and it's going boom, 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 which means that you either need to buffer these events that are being cranked out over here, or you need to sample them, just drop events, or whatever it is that you need to do, but you've got standard ways of dealing with all that. <clears throat> and I alluded to this a little bit uh, before, but one of the things that they talk a lot about in reactive programming is hot versus cold streams. <clears throat> so one easy way to think of cold streams is like reading from a book. Nothing happens until you decide to read from it, similar to like the streams before. Until you had the terminal operator, nothing happened until it was there. And you can restart, generally. As opposed to a hot stream, classic example being like a thermostat. It's putting out data, if you're listening or not, you know, tree in a forest falling kind of thing. It's just going on, going on, going on. You can sample from it, you can do whatever it is that you need to do but it's cranking out data, it's emitting data. This is yielding data, emitting data, to go back to some of those terms that we uh, were very careful about uh, earlier. This is emitting data whether or not there is an observer. So, now on to Kotlin. Specifically as of 1.3. <coughs> Excuse me. So Kotlin was created by JetBrains, uh, IntelliJ, uh, and they've been doing this for a very long time. One of the significant advantages that JetBrains had compared to a lot of companies that have done languages like you know, Oracle and you know, uh, Sun and Microsoft and 
the rest is they were very much on both ends of the spectrum on the theory, you know, like making things work and the practicality of what people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so with that, they, uh, not going to go into the whole history of it and why they developed it, but they've uh, essentially got a really good grasp on the theory and practicality of the different languages and lots of different languages. <coughs> uh, so much so that by the time it was 1.0, you know, basically you had a lot of your major players in the industry like Google, like Spring, you know, some of the big, you know, big boys out there were saying, yep, that's one of our major supported languages. You know, you have like Java and Kotlin. And now, you know, with Google, with Android, they basically said, yeah, you've got Kotlin and Java. Um, just because it was such a blatantly, obviously, you know, like well thought out language. Um, compiles to JVM and Android, JavaScript, native. Uh, so it's very much designed to be used in a uh, multi-environment way. And I use it primarily almost exclusively for the JVM. Uh, we'll see a lot of that stuff. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I've, you know, I love languages. I use lots of languages. You can probably tell. <coughs> I really love Kotlin. It's just a fun language. Really practical, a lot of fun, really simple once you get past some of the weird stuff that you might not be used to. Um, really powerful. And about a year ago at DISH, I gave a talk on uh, just an intro to Kotlin. Um, again, all these slides are available to you. Uh, this is going at primarily from the perspective of, hey, you're a Java developer. What are some of the ways that Kotlin is better Java? Which is just the tiny little thing of what makes Kotlin awesome um, is that it's a better Java. Uh, but, you know, you need to start somewhere. And uh, being a much better Java is a good place to start. A couple of core concepts that you'll see a lot of in some of these code examples, so I want to get them out of the way right away, is uh, most everything is an expression. If is an expression, not a statement. Try is an expression, not a statement, uh, you know, etc. So virtually everything, including, you know, like your function declarations are expressions, not necessarily statements. Um, and the part that's going to hurt your head the most, I can guarantee it, uh, in this, if you're not used to it, is extension functions. It's one of the coolest features of Kotlin by far, but until you get used to it, it'll hurt your head. Because uh, it's not very difficult when you, you know, like see what it's actually doing. If you've uh, done, especially like early versions of Python and Perl, and a lot of those that went from being a straight scripting procedural language over to being an OO language, you saw how the, what, the way that they did that was that the very first uh, argument to every OO function, every method, was self or this. It was just an implicit first argument to all, every function that, it, that automatically turned it into a polymorphic method instead of simply being a function. That's essentially pretty much exactly what Kotlin is doing for you right here. So here I'm saying function string dot make nice uh, is equal to this plus this nice. And what that's doing is it means that I can now do something like this. I can take a string and now I have a new method on the string called make nice. What that's actually doing is it's creating a function where the first parameter is a string, you know, very similar to like the self or this in those uh, early OO languages. <clears throat> now, the reason why you do that is, for one, if you're familiar with Ruby and you're familiar with monkey patching, how awesome monkey patching is, because you can change how, or, you know, you do the same thing in JavaScript. You know, you take like, you know, 
your string dot prototype and you change what's there on that string. You know what string will respond to. <laughs> oh, you do the same thing with with Ruby, where you can use your uh, your meta programming to change how you know the classes and instances work. That's not what's happening here. This is all statically typed. So you're not changing the instances, you're not changing the classes. String is a final, if you're familiar with Java. It's the final class. You can't change it. Uh, but what it's doing is, for one, it's making it look like you can have methods, you know, add methods to something, which is useful in some ways that we'll see. It also makes sure that you scope what it is that you're uh, adding. So that's really useful in making kind of on-demand on DSLs, domain-specific languages, which with these coroutines, we'll be doing a lot of. All right, so let's create some threads. Uh, for our examples here, this is just some bootstrap code, so you know what's going on. So we're going to uh, do a process launcher how many times we want to do something, and it takes in a function that takes an int and returns nothing. Unit is uh, Colin's version of void. Uh, but <clears throat> we're going to record when we start, print that out, including the thread that we're on, how many active threads are going. We'll actually launch that function, and then we'll keep track of when we end, and show the diff, the delta. Okay, straightforward. <coughs> so, this could be done in Java. I'm doing it in Kotlin just because Kotlin's simpler and it makes it easier for showing some of the stuff that we'll be doing later. So, we have main process here, process launcher. We're going to launch 5,000 threads. Okay, 5,000 threads. Uh, we have a mutable list of those threads. For those of you that have done thread programming in Java, you know why I'm doing this. It's because of this right here. I will get to that. But uh, so we're going to start spawning threads, add them to our list of threads, start it, and you know, just spawn all these threads. And every thousand threads that we create, we're going to say, hey, I you know, have these threads and, you know, here's how many are currently active. This is here because these threads are daemon threads. So if you do this without this, who, who wants to tell me what would happen if I don't have this line? Because join says join with the current thread. Join that thread with, with my current thread. What happens if I don't do this? It ends, it ends early. Right, it starts. It spawns a bunch of threads and then ends. It doesn't wait for those threads to finish or anything. It spawns them and ends. So this is my sync to async barrier. We'll talk a lot more about that. <clears throat> so this is the output. So we start. We've got two active threads. Uh, and uh, JVM programmers, you know, that's main thread and GC thread. I. Uh, so for that first one, hey, we have 5,002. So we start 5,000 threads. Uh, at 2,000 threads, we've got you know that many active, 3,000 threads. Oh, thread 1,000 because you know thread programming is as easy as one, three, two. Um, thread 4,000, thread 5,000. There wasn't the appropriate. <laughs> So let's go wild and crazy. Let's go from 5,000 to 6,000. Okay, that's the only change. 5,000 to 6,000. Running on my Mac, boom, out of memory exception. Blows up, um, it uh, starts up to 5,099 active threads, process finished with exit code zero, uh, one because it doesn't uh, finish properly, boom. Uh, because I'm running this on OpenJDK 12, you can kind of see it here, it starts p-threads, 
Uh, the JVM makes use of your operating system threads. And so you're limited to the number of threads that are even available to you, much less out of memory or anything like that. You're limited by how many threads the operating system is willing to give you. So unless you want to like change kernel parameters and stuff, you, you know, Linux programmers unite, you know. Um, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's do this with coroutines instead. Uh, you can see this a little bit different, but so here's our run blocking, but this is our synchronous asynchronous barrier. We'll talk a lot more about this later, but uh, so we're saying, hey, I'm going to uh, start a coroutine scope. Um, and it's blocking, so it's synchronous. But inside here, everything is asynchronous, or most everything is asynchronous. Uh, we're going to start, you know, do our thing. Launch is essentially like thread, but we'll talk about the differences. But essentially, this is our starting that new process. Delay is the obvious. And uh, yeah, there you go. So we're going to delay for 10 seconds. Every thousand, we're going to print out how many active threads we have. Straightforward. <coughs> All right. So end duration, 10,154 milliseconds. Forgot to point that out for threads. Uh, 11,763 milliseconds. Obviously, your uh, mileage may vary, but you know, to give you a picture here. <coughs> Note also, how many threads are ever started up? Zero. We get 5,000 of these coroutines going, actually taking 10 seconds each. But we are all, we're, we're not starting any new threads. This is essentially the node programming model. We're going full async. <clears throat> now, 5,000, 6,000 whips. Can we all agree 5 million is a bit more than 5,000 or 6,000? Eighteen seconds. Okay. Yeah, there's some overhead to dealing with five million processes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what if I actually do want to use like more threads than you know going the pure node model? All right. So for the launch, we then hand it off to an I/O dispatcher. Uh, we'll talk about the dispatchers in a moment, but essentially that's saying, hey, yeah, use this uh, thread pool for I.O. And so it's using the uh, fork join common th uh, pool, if you're familiar with that from uh, your Java executors. Uh, default dispatcher, worker 13, 18 active, 23 active, and it only ever gets to 23 active, even though we're starting, you know, 5,000 of these things. Uh, it's you know in the course of doing it, it's kind of reusing some of these workers, but you know it only ever really starts up 23 threads to handle everything. Even though we are in fact using a thread pool. Okay. So dispatchers. What's going on is you know it's doing those launches. So it's creating these processes, these coroutines. It's putting them onto a queue to hand off to a dispatcher. The dispatcher, in the case of like our last one, will hand it off to a thread pool. You know, actually, it's an executor. If you're familiar with the you know the uh, modern Java threading model, where you have executors, so it's handing it off to an executor, which is a thread pool. These two are busy, and it goes, hey. You know, you want something, so hey, I'll hand you the next item. And just kind of keep going through that. In the case where there isn't a thread pool, you know, it, you know, basically there's just one of these guys sitting there. But, and handing it off, handing it off. So your primary dispatchers are the default dispatcher. And what that is, is uh, this is meant for compute 
uh, intensive stuff. So the pool size is the number of CPU cores. Because it's not going to do you any good to have a thread pool larger than the number of cores that you have if, you're th if your CPU is being fully utilized. All right? This fetcher's I.O. is uh, on-demand creates threads. And this is meant for I.O. intensive blocking operations. So if you're going off to disk, database, network calls, all those kinds of things where what the CPU is doing while you're making that I.O. call is just going, okay, let me know when you're finished. Are you finished yet? How about now? Now? But you're using threads to wait for it because it needs to wait for it. But in a normal, it, so if you're doing it in a synchronous fashion, you know, you get to it and you're like, your CPU usage goes whoop, but you know, you're blocking, nothing else can use that thread while you're waiting for the response. <clears throat> and dispatcher's main is used primarily for UI programming. You know, going back to what we were talking about on all UIs are always signal thread. And you have your custom dispatchers, uh, your primary ones are, you know, like single thread, thread context, fixed thread pool. You can take any executor and turn it into a dispatcher. <coughs> um, quick little aside on Kotlin. If you want to turn something into something that's very, very similar, so like it's a very thin wrapper, it usually has these as extension functions. If you want to turn something into something similar, but it, it but it takes actual work to do so. Those are two, whatever. So like stream to list, as opposed to like collection as list or something like that. You know, if they're very functionally the same, there's as functions. If it takes computation to do it, or if you're fundamentally changing it, those are two extensions. <coughs> So let's dissect this a little bit. Run blocking, as I said, we'd come back to that. Here's the definition of run blocking, straight from the source code. Uh, it takes a context, but it has a, uh, a default, notice we didn't have to actually pass it in, of empty coroutine context. So when, uh, in general, that's going to mean my main method, uh, execution, and then the block to actually execute, uh, and it happens on a coroutine scope. So it creates a new coroutine scope. That's the whole point of this. But it's also acting as that synchronous asynchronous barrier. That's why it's keeping track of the current thread there. Now one thing to note is run blocking generally should appear in exactly one place in your code, in the main method. Because after that, you don't want, you know, if you're doing, you know, if you're crossing the synchronous asynchronous barrier, that means that you need to deal with locks, synchronization, all those kinds of things that are bad, evil things to deal with, unless you really, really have to. <coughs> the coroutine scope is very similar to what I was talking about before, where it keeps track of Here's these different coroutines that I spawn off. And so you can either cancel the parent, in which case it cancels all the children, and the parent will wait until all the children have finished. So if you remember before, we just simply launched all those you know, coroutines, and we didn't do a join on them because it wasn't going to finish the parent until all those children had finished. Launch is, it has to, uh, this has to be called in the context of a coroutine scope. Um, and you pass to it the block to run, which again is going to be running on a coroutine scope, but this is going to be a coroutine scope that's created by launch as a sub, uh, as a child of this one. So, uh, you don't need to specify a context. If you uh, don't need to specify context, it inherits the caller's context, 
But remember, before we took that example where we, you know, specified the the I/O <laughs> dispatcher, um, and it returns a job, which is essentially, you know, it's just a handle for if you want to do a cancel, if you want to do a join, if you want to do any of those kinds of things. There's your handle for doing that. <laughs> In delay, you know. Okay. Um, now. In a few places, we've seen this. This is, you know, kind of the special sauce. What's with that suspend? Um, it's what marks the function as being a coroutine. What does that mean? Remember async when we were talking about promises in JavaScript? It's, e it's essentially doing the same kind of work. Uh, to the com uh, compiler, it's going to tell it hey, break this thing apart in certain ways. So when you call another coroutine, another function that has been declared with suspend, you know, behave similar to when you saw that await, and you know, then break it apart into the thens, which gave you those seams for doing the yielding. It's doing the same kind of thing. The implementation is very different than what uh, JavaScript does much more efficient, but conceptually, it's the same idea. <clears throat> All right, the way that it does it is it goes back to CPUs. How does your CPU handle moving between processes? It uses a concept called continuations. Essentially what that means is it snapshots its state which then allows it to kind of push this off to the side, start up the new thing, you know, in the CPU, you know, move your programmer counter, all that kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> but, you know, move the state over here, start the new one, rehydrate it into the CPU effectively, and uh, with, the, with the state that it was snapshotted with, run that for the time period, and basically it's doing this snapshotting, you know, uh, hydrate, uh, you know, dehydrating, hydrating, you know, but this continuations is the way that it's snapshotting things so they can move between processes. That's what it's doing in the CPU. That's what it's doing in Kotlin. That's what the compiler turns things into. <coughs> There's an open JDK proposal called Project Loom to bring this into the JDK. Uh, they call it fibers in there. Uh, because they couldn't call it threads, and fibers are smaller than threads. <coughs> um, it gives a re-entry capability to the function, very similar to what I just described for CPUs. Uh, extremely lightweight way to not only pause the function, but to move that state, because if you're snapshotting it, that means that you can like move it into another process. Let's talk about our async styles. Here's our classic synchronous blocking style for like a send email. Here's doing it in a nodish way, you know, with callbacks. So when this uh, completes, it'll call our callback. You know, if there's an error, go uses a very similar kind of style. Uh, email result, you return back nothing. Uh, here's doing it with uh, future promise uh, in Kotlin. It's known as a deferred. A deferred can be turned into a future or a promise. Remember, Kotlin is multi-platform, and there's a you know. So from the deferred, there's an as future as promise. Um, so send email uh, async is to remind you as the caller that you got to do something with this. And as a coroutine, it's suspend, but otherwise it looks exactly like our classic blocking. <clears throat> so our larger, larger business processing, async, because it's going to return a deferred, of course. You know, once you're in asynchronous world, you stay in asynchronous world. <clears throat> um, and you have to call await. Uh, here, you can only call a coroutine from a coroutine. 
unless you have that synchronous asynchronous barrier. Um, what happens if you forget to call await? You know, JavaScript programmers should know that very well. You know, basically, again, it just kind of starts up and is running out there off on its own. Um, here, you'd find out right away because, you know, we're re actually returning a result and checking the result, and this is statically compiled, so, you know, your signatures are different. But, um, now again, Kotlin cheats because functionally the two are, are the same. From a performance perspective, the coroutine is a lot, uh, is a lot faster because it's using those continuations rather than this more heavyweight construct that has to do some synchronization for uh, the deferrals. Uh, though it cheats even further because it actually implements a weight as a coroutine um, and async uses the scope concurrency. Uh, however, you know, it's not saying don't ever use you know, like async await, here's a you know perfectly good reason for doing so where you want to call off to like, you know, this is obviously a contrived example, but 100 different services and wait for them all to return. Nice, simple way to do it. Channels. <coughs> How many people have worked, or, uh, have worked with uh, Go routines, Go channels? No Go programmers. Ah. <coughs> uh, channels uh, are, here's a send channel, a receive channel, and then a general interface channel, uh, which simply implements both of those. Uh, but on it, you know, you can send to the send channel. Shocking, I know. Um, you can close send channel. Uh, receive channel is where are you? You know, you're, it's the other side. Uh, you're receiving things. Though generally, the way that you work with it is with an iterator. You know, so you just iterate over the things that are coming in off that channel. And you can cancel that. Uh, Kotlin has that question mark means that it's nullable. Uh, Kotlin, one of the many awesome features of the language is nulls are a part of the language. As opposed to other places, you know, like uh, where, you know, null in Java or C or the rest, nulls are bad, evil, you know, classically the, uh, the billion dollar mistake, um, because they mean, you know, like you don't really know how your program's going to react to things if a null is returned. You have to do a whole bunch of defensive coding. And Kotlin, that's not the case because it's part of the type system. Uh, and the type system makes sure that you can't use nulls improperly. That if it can possibly return a null, that you're checking for it. If it cannot possibly return a null, you don't bother checking for it. Because it cannot possibly return a null. Um, very nice, easy way to do things. Uh, much better than like the nun, if you're familiar with like Scala or, you know, some of those. Uh, much cleaner way to do things. But anyway. Side point to what we're talking about. Everything is typed. Hmm? Everything is typed. It's an extremely st uh, st uh, strongly typed language. Much stronger typing than Java. <clears throat> Not quite to the extent of like Scala, though different. <clears throat> so to talk about this, uh, partly because like the Go documentation refer uh, uses these examples. Everybody's familiar with Fibonacci, you know, sequences, you know, 0, 1, 1, you know, 1 plus 2 is 3, you know, da, da, da. So, using that, rather than getting distracted over the algorithm, let's take a look at how this can be implemented for some of these different uh, styles. So, in a very functional programming way of doing things, it's very common in functional programming to have infinite sequences. Because if you think about math, you know, how large is the series of all, infi of all positive numbers? It's infinite. How large is the series of Fibonacci numbers? It's infinite. How large is the series of prime numbers? It's infinite. You know, so when you're dealing with things in the mathematical world, 
you'll deal with a lot of infinite. <laughs> and so it's just kind of baked into a lot of functional programming of infinite series. <clears throat> so like here, we've got while true, which is an infinite loop, <clears throat> um, and send x. But what happens down here in the main is for what I in our Fibonacci sequence, we're just, uh, this take 10 is just like, okay, I, uh, I know you're an infinite series, but just give me the first 10. And so it'll run through here until it, you know, until it's sent 10 of them. After it's sent 10 of them, this is going to uh, call cancel on this. And so it'll stop. Uh, and so we're printing out our Fibonacci sequence. If you want to do it in a go co uh, coroutine kind of way, uh, we're going to create a channel of ints. We're going to launch, you know, like a go routine, our you know Fibonacci, and we're going to say, give us ten things and publish them to that channel. So it, this is a send channel. So we're going to send to that channel, as you can see here, channel .send. And then we're just going to iterate over them. So this is a way to do asynchronous programming uh, using channels. And this is like how Go does asynchronous programming. Very efficient. You know, famously Go lets you do this kind of stuff in a very, very efficient way. Selecting among uh, multiple channels, uh, you can, you know, Again, if you want to do more complicated things where you're like sending an explicit quit signal uh, so you don't have to send like how many you're going to be doing and that kind of stuff. Um, there's selectors that you can use to select among multiple channels because they could be happening at different times, but you still want the same basic code to work on them. Not going to bother going over this. It'll take way more than our time. <coughs> uh, fanning out. So we can uh, create a channel, but have multiple coroutines watching that channel, and it's going to handle it appropriately. It'll basically happen like a queue with multiple uh, listeners in an MQ kind of situation, if you're familiar with classic enterprise queuing. <coughs> so here, you know, we're going to do our letters A to Z, send off, you know, the letter, and there's nine different uh, coroutines watching it. And here we're going, you know, print out those things, you know, there you go. Um, nothing too terribly exciting about that, except it points out that you can have multiple listeners on the same channel. And it handles all the synchronization essentially for that. Again, very similar to what you're used to if you do like MQ series, active MQ, Kafka, any of those kinds of enterprise messaging systems, same kind of thing, but all in process. In fact, here we're doing it on like the default dispatcher, but we could have done it all on main. You know, like even all of these were all happening on main and nev we never started up anything, any thread pools or anything. <coughs> Let actors handle our shareable mutable state. Uh, as it says, in addition to being uh, easier to do the locking right, because there is no locking, so yay. Um, it's also much more performant because there's no locking, so yay. <laughs> actors, um, not gonna spend too much time on this except to say, you know, Another nice little feature of, of uh, Kotlin is we can have sealed classes. What this is basically saying is that all subclasses for counter message are going to be defined in the same file. And what that allows us to do is when we do a win, which is similar to like a switch, is it will do a, uh, um, a completeness test for us. So it'll make sure that you've covered all of your poss possibilities. So like this, uh, it's basically saying, hey, I'm going to, this is going to be taking counter messages, which would be one of these things. Object is the way of declaring a singleton. Um, 
And uh, so we've got a channel that's going to take in these counter messages. And so when we receive that, we're going to check, is it an increment counter? If so, do this. If it's a get counter, do this. We'll talk about what that's doing in just a moment. Um, but so then down here going, hey, you know, do this 100 times, send increment counter, and then we're going to get the value back out. Because remember, the only way that you can talk to an actor is by way of messaging. This is cheating a little bit, but not really. Because if we were just doing a counter, the right way to do a counter on the JVM is atomic integer or atomic law. This is too complicated. However, for you know, fitting something onto a slide, you don't want to do something much more complicated than that. But you can see, essentially, we're maintaining a state here. And so whether that's like a much more complicated state machine that we're maintaining or just a counter, the idea is exactly the same. <clears throat> what this completable deferred is, is it's similar to like a future or uh, a atomic reference, again, if you're familiar with the JVM's uh, concurrency library, uh, to where it can be set once. And then after that, you know, it can never be set again. Um, so it's an atomic setting. And so with that, and that happens in a thread safe way. <clears throat> so here we're going to go, hey, we're going to pass in a mutating, a, mut a mutable response, but it can only be mutated one time, exactly one time. <clears throat> and uh, with that, we don't know what's actually going to come out of this actor, so we're going to do an await on it. And this is going to handle you know, that, that back and forth that needs to happen. Uh, this is similar to like a sleep uh, notify, uh, if you're uh, or wait notify, if you're familiar with doing that on the JVM, but much, much simpler. Um, and then we, of course, have to close that channel. But this allows us to, again, deal with shared mutable state without having to worry about locks or any of that. And last item is flows. So you can think of them at like streams, but they've got a channel underneath. So it allows you to do a lot of these things like moving between threads, doing every, uh, all this stuff in a very nicely async concurrent way, uh, parallel way when you're dealing with multiple threads. Uh, speaking of which, that was one of the distinctions I promised to clarify earlier is when you're dealing with, you know, like all that node-ish kinds of stuff where it's all happening on like the main thread, we're not using multiple threads, that's doing concurrency. When we're using a thread pool, we're still doing concurrency, but we're also doing parallel to where they're literally happening, depending on how many cores you have, at the same time. Concurrency is about the way that you structure things. The, uh, parallelism is about the way that you actually execute them. And it's by doing concurrency that you can get proper parallelism. And by doing asynchronicity is how you can get, you know, so they, kind of, they build on each other to do it in a safe way. Uh, anyway, flows give you uh, these nice capabilities like streams but they also give you a very lightweight way of doing kind of some of those reactive capabilities that we talked about before. Just to you know, essentially make the point, so we've got a base flow. You can create flows off of, you know, excuse me, uh, list, you know, list.as flow, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, or you could do it this way. So we're just gonna iterate over th things the way I did. The reason why I did it this way as opposed to like straight from a list it's because I wanted to do this 200 milliseconds, you know, delay between items. But it's just going to emit items, and but here's a very reactive kind of thing. We're going to say sample every 500 milliseconds. So this is going to be putting things out every 200 milliseconds. It's going to emit items every 200 milliseconds. This is a hot flow. Um, or it's behaving as a hot flow. It's actually a cold flow underneath, but whatever. Um, it, but this is essentially, so if you think about it like moving through a channel, 
and you've got a sluice on the channel, it'll just open the sluice every 500 milliseconds. So, you know, one at 200 milliseconds, two at 400 milliseconds, okay, channel opens, three happens at 600 milliseconds, so it gets through. Sluice closes, you know, so it's sampling at every 500 milliseconds. <clears throat> so if you could read the uh, output, it says, okay, three comes through, five comes through, eight comes through, because it's just sampling every 500 milliseconds. Back to that, you know, what if you have a producer that's producing faster than your consumer can consume it? <clears throat> uh, so we're mapping items, uh, and here I'm capturing as part of doing that mapping the thread that it's happening on. And I'm going to say flow on the default dispatcher, so it's going to use a thread pool. And it's going to be doing all of this on that default thread pool, as you can see here, default dispatcher. Uh, however, when I collect it, which is my terminal operation, it's that, as I said, it's actually a cold, uh, uh, a cold stream. This is what's going to be pulling the items in. And But here I'm going to say, but do this with the context of our main uh, you know, thread. So printing on main, and it's uh, printing out the item that was enriched with the fact that it happened on the default dispatcher thread pool. <clears throat> I know that was a lot to take in, a lot to absorb. That's why you have the slides <laughs> and code. Um, but hopefully, you know, like I said, that gives you the context to uh, do more. We didn't really talk about error handling. Obviously, that would you know really blow up the length of the talk. Uh, integration with things like RxJava, um, et cetera. Uh, these are for lightweight things, including for doing really nice integrations with those and giving you those like nice little leverage points within your program to better use those. Um, but if you want like full scale uh, industrial capabilities for like again doing actors across Kafka uh, clusters, then um, or across um, Kubernetes clusters, then you know use Akka or Kafka and all those kinds of things. So just the tip of the iceberg, but gets you started. Uh, there's the proposal. You know more information. Essentially the appendix. From uh, where to go for a bunch of really good stuff, including a really good YouTube talk by uh, Roman, who's one of the primary people behind all this stuff. And so he goes into a lot of the details on if you're the kind of person who really likes to kind of dig in there and find out how this stuff works, that's good stuff. And with that, we're done. Thanks. Thank you.